Good afternoon and welcome to Family Weekend. My name is Shanze Tahir and I'm a senior concentrating in Ethnic Studies and Biology. I serve as the president of the Undergraduate Council of Students. UCS works collaboratively with students and administrators to advocate for and bring about change students want to see. This year, we're working on an array of initiatives, which range from increasing admissions, access for first-gen low-income students, to addressing interpersonal harm within our communities. Over the past three years, Brown has pushed me to grow in ways I never expected and given me a family of friends and mentors I'm constantly grateful for. A friend who is in high school recently reached out to me and asked me, why Brown? After giving her a long list, I was able to look back and say confidently that Brown has helped me grow into the person I've always wanted to be. It is always a special time when families visit and where we are able to show our loved ones the places where we, as students, have made so many memories we hold closely. I remember walking through Brown with my parents last summer, showing them the spot my friends and I love to go to on the main green, where we've laughed endlessly and shared so much joy. I took them to my first year residence hall, and they went to the floor where I made my lifelong friends. They even met my professor, who has guided me so much in both my academic and personal development. Being able to share these places, people, and moments with my family, my anchors throughout my life, has been immensely special. I hope you all are able to share in the warmth and community of Family Weekend and make new memories with your loved ones. This evening, I have the honor of introducing President Christina Paxson, who has been instrumental in creating an environment at Brown that fosters immense student growth. Please join me in welcoming President Paxson. Thank you so much, Hanze, and thanks for all the work that you're doing for Brown, you and your colleagues. It's really terrific. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Family Weekend. And I love seeing students and families reunite on campus, walking around, doing exactly what Shanze was talking about, which is learning what the student experience is like here. Soon I'll introduce our keynote speaker, who's fantastic. But first, I'd like to speak a little bit to the Brown experience and what it will likely lead to in your children's lives. I know many of you are the parents of first-year students or families of first-year students. Some of you are a little bit more experienced, and I hope what I say rings true to you. I think that what happens here can be distilled down to one word, and that word is transformation. The fact is that when young people go off to college, they are not completely grown up. They're not done. They change. And some of these changes are more superficial than others. Some are more transient than others. Like when you find out at Thanksgiving that your cheeseburger-loving child has become a vegan just before the turkey comes out of the oven. <laughs> or that your child is considering taking a semester away to go to some distant state to create a Bitcoin startup, maybe. Or that your child has become politically liberal if you are conservative, or politically conservative if you're liberal. Regardless of what changes may be, your conversations over dinner are certainly going to become more lively. But, but seriously, you know, that, that's not the transformation I'm talking about. The transformation that I really want to draw your attention to today is just uh, something that's much more substantive and much more important. As your child moves through Brown, or your brother or sister, I see lots of siblings here today, you'll see tremendous growth in maturity and intellectual sophistication and sense of purpose. Our job at Brown is to enable this transformation, to make it happen, to do everything we can to ensure that our students, your children, become innovative thinkers and collaborative problem solvers and compassionate citizens of the world. And at Brown, we do this in three ways. And I just want to talk briefly about three things that I think are important. One, and you've probably heard this before, but it's always worth repeating, we empower our students to chart their own academic journeys. That's the signature piece of Brown, the open curriculum. 
And it's made Brown a place of uncommon collaboration across disciplines, a place where students are free to explore, to create, think rigorously, and find what they love while they're here. Now, the open curriculum, it used to be called the new curriculum. That was 50 years ago when it was started. But I think the open curriculum is more relevant now than ever, ever before. We're in a rapidly changing world. Societies feel like they're in flux. Country dynamics feel like they're changing. And we need innovators. We need people who can work across divides, intellectual, social, political. And we need people who can work across different fields of knowledge. And that's exactly what the open curriculum supports. Every day, I see the results, and I think they're truly remarkable. And I can give you just a few examples. Uh, for example, two second year students recently took a public policy class on building powerful organizations for social change. And they met up for coffee one day in the Blue Room to talk about an assignment. And they discovered a shared passion for using art as a medium for raising awareness about mental health. Now, being Brown students, you know, they could have just finished their coffee and gone off and worried about the assignment, and, and that was the end of it, but they didn't do that. They quickly took steps with the support from the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship to form a nonprofit group, Art to Reduce Mental Health Stigma. So this is normal. You just form your nonprofit. It's called ARMS. And they followed that up with a, a debut arms event just this fall to kick off the new academic year. And it was a highly successful open mic session where uh, students talked about how to hold productive conversations and non-stigmatizing conversations about mental health. This is just one small example of the extraordinary versatility of an open liberal arts education that makes it so valuable today in this world and so capable of creating transformative experiences. Second point, we strive hard to create an environment where everybody knows they belong. Diversity is a cornerstone of academic excellence. We, we believe that to our cores, and we thrive as a community of people from all over the world, all over the country, who learn from each other and from life experiences that are different from their own. In recent years, we've made a lot of progress uh, in enacting our Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. It came out a couple years ago. And it aims, among other things, to make everyone at Brown feel and know that they, are, they belong here, that they're a central part of our community. And this makes Brown a place where students and faculty and staff from all backgrounds and all perspectives want to be. They want to come here. Sometime in 2014 or 15, I can't remember the exact year, uh, three students came to my office hours. They were all first generation students. Their parents hadn't gone to college. And they described what it was like not to have a roadmap for navigating college life that their peers seemed to have. They talked about trying to fit in and often questioning whether Brown was right for them. This conversation led to an idea, which two years ago, after a lot of student input, became the Ivy League's first and only first generation college and low income student center, which today provides opportunities and empowers our first generation and low income students. And the best part of this story is that it wasn't a top down thing. This was the result of the entire Brown community coming together to make something really great happen. Now, I would add that similar conversations has led to a robust program for veterans, students in ROTC, uh, and other groups. This is not a one-off event at Brown. This is how we do things, in collaboration, in partnership with our students. And it makes Brown a really special place where people do feel like they belong. And it's transformative. So third, we provide unmatched resources for students to put their developing academic skills and creativity and drive to the best possible use. One thing we do here really well at Brown is what we call hubs. Uh, our Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship is fast becoming one of the most impactful hubs on campus. 
Their students are hatching ideas and they're launching ventures and they're honing entrepreneurial skills, not just in business, but thinking about how organizations and enterprises can transform lives. Few examples. This past summer, Brown students started something called Koi Prosthetics. It produces low-cost prosthetics for amputees in low-income countries, and they've been working in Vietnam and are starting to work in other places as well. Another example is cloud agronomics, which uses remote sensing to provide farmers with real-time information on crop disease risk. They've been working in Florida and are now spreading out into other states. There's more of the same at another rising hub on campus, the Institute of Brown for Environment and, and Society, or called IBIS, where two Brown students are collaborating on an effort to promote improved beekeeping practices throughout New Rhode Island. Now you may think, bees? Why bees? What's important about bees? And it turns out bees are actually really important. The story here is that with the long-term threats posed by environmental degradation to ecosystem diversity and food production, bees matter. They matter a lot as pollinators. They matter a lot to the food chain. And so through a survey with the Audubon Society, an IBIS student and an applied math concentrator got together. They're gathering information on bee health, food availability, beekeeping training, policy making, you name it. And this is the kind of innovative transformational work that we see sparking around the campus on a regular basis. There's one more thing. Brown's ability to transform the lives of its students is only as good as our ability to attract the best and brightest students here at Brown. And I think we do a pretty good job of that. We've worked hard to remove obstacles to having the transformative experience students have once they get here. And this has entailed taking very serious steps to make sure a Brown education is more accessible and affordable for everybody. So that's why last year, just around this time, and I think I spoke about it at this event last year. For some of you who are parents who were here last year, you'll remember this. We were just starting to launch something called the Brown Promise. And that had a view to helping our students avoid the debt burden that can often come with going to college. And now, our very generous Brown community of alumni and friends and parents, it's come together to make this happen. So this fall, 1,452 undergraduate students from first years to seniors arrived on College Hill to the liberating reality that the university loans in their financial aid packages, the package loans, have been replaced with Brown scholarships. So in the timeless words of one student who's benefited from the Brown promise, he said, in a world without debt, he would feel like he could fly. And flying, that's, that's the kind of transformation that we're talking about here. That's what it looks like. Now, on that note, our Family Weekend keynote speaker is in the house, and this is a Brown parent who has done some transformational things in her life. We all know that it's a very, very complicated time in journalism when public trust in the media has plummeted, sadly. But in a highly polarized environment, we need the fourth estate more than we ever have before. As citizens, we look to journalists to report on issues in ways that enlighten us and help us understand. We, we seek authenticity and we seek truth. And that's where Maria Hinojosa has been doing for a brilliant 30-year career as a journalist and author and storyteller and chronicler of lives under duress. As a reporter, she has uh, worked on hundreds and hundreds of important stories from the restrictive immigration policies in Fremont, Nebraska, to the effects of the oil boom on native people in North Dakota, to stories of poverty in Alabama, and many, many other things. At National Public Radio, she was among the first to report on youth violence in urban communities on a national scale. A hallmark of her reporting is to bring attention to the untold stories across America, the experiences and the perspectives that are often overlooked or underreported in mainstream media. 
Her work on the digital video series Humanizing America has helped deconstruct narratives and stereotypes about the American electorate. In the run-up to the 2016 presidential election, for example, she explored what it means to be young and Latino or black and Republican, revealing to voters and potential voters with diverse motivations that there, there are people out there whose voices should be heard and by doing so, transforming lives in the process. As an anchor and executive producer of NPR's only Latino news and culture show, Latino USA, and of the PBS series America by the Numbers with Maria Hinojosa, she has informed millions about the changing cultural and political landscape in America and abroad. Over the years, there are many awards here, Maria's work has garnered scores of prestigious journalism recognitions, including, get this, four Emmys, a Peabody Award, the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism. I think I'm embarrassing you. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> the, the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Reporting on the Disadvantaged and the Edward R. Murrow Award for her documentary, Child Brides, Stolen Lives. Beyond the awards, her work is more profoundly about opening the eyes of Americans to injustice and unfairness, while at the same time really celebrating America's rich diversity and empowering people to navigate a complex world. And she sees allies in higher education at places like Brown. Last month, uh, Columbia University was very fortunate to have her as their convocation speaker. And she called on students there to recognize their power to transform lives and make the world better, noting, and I quote, we have privilege. I need you to not feel overwhelmed, but rather when you are feeling weakness, focus on gratitude, focus on feeling lucky. If you're in this place where you have this gratitude, that will lead you to understand privilege and responsibility. I couldn't agree more. So please join me in welcoming Maria Hinojosa. Thank you. You know, I give a lot of speeches, um, and I don't get nervous, but when your daughter and your husband are in the front row, it's like, ugh! So, um, you know, I, I'm a little nervous, which is why I'm glad the water's here. Thank you. I was not going to make the joke, but it's true. I really, I really have to stand over here, because if I stand over here, you won't really be able to see me. So, um, I'm a chaparra as we say in Mexican Spanish. Um, I'm a shorty. Um, thank you, President Paxton. Thank you so much. And to whoever thought of inviting me, like, OK, thank you. This is really um, an extraordinary honor. Um, to my daughter, Jurema, because she actually, I want to thank her for falling in love with Brown um, and for believing in herself when the truth is, like all the parents here, I was seriously terrified about her getting rejected. So I was like, do you really have to love Brown that much? Uh, but she believed in herself, and here she is. So bravo. There you are. Hi. Hi. Um, to my extraordinary husband, who, <laughs> if it wasn't for him, she wouldn't be here because, seriously, he's the one, this amazing, amazing artist um, from the Dominican Republic is the one who kind of raised her. <laughs> Hard to give a speech when your husband is in the front row, too. Uh, so what you don't know, and actually she doesn't know, and certainly President Paxton doesn't know, is I, I have actually formed this beautiful and quiet and intense relationship with Brown that's kind of not surprising. But the way it happened um, is interesting, the way it began. So when I was a CNN correspondent, um, so my career, uh, as the pre president said, whether it's at NPR, at CNN, at PBS, or now with my own nonprofit media company, I, I have my own company now. Um, we're based in Harlem, USA. We have internships for students, so hey, apply. Um, we are committed to changing the stories. We're committed to telling the stories of a changing America from a perspective that is not one of fear. Um, and so we talk about the Latino, Latino 
Latina or Latinx reality. Um, we talk about immigrants, we talk about people of color, we talk about all of this change without a sense of fear. Um, so I anchor um, a podcast, an NPR show called Latino USA. It's been around for 25 years. Um, I'm expecting some applause at the mention of Latino USA. Now, if those of you, if you're like, what is she talking about? What's a podcast? Later, or maybe even now, you can take your parents' phone out and show them where to subscribe um, to a podcast and get them to download Latino USA so that they can listen to it. Um, the majority of our audience on public radio is actually not Latino because public radio has an issue with diversifying its audience. But digitally, um, digitally, our audience is younger POC majority women, so we kind of cover the spectrum. So I would love for you to listen to it if you don't. We also produce um, In the Thick, which is a politics podcast um, that we started after one of the Sunday morning politics shows stopped inviting me after having invited me for seven times in a row and then they stopped inviting me and I was like, wait, what? It was fun to be a part of the 1%, wait, and I'm not? And I was very upset. And then my team was like, let's create our own Sunday morning political talk show. But it won't be on Sunday mornings, it'll be a podcast that drops on Tuesdays and Fridays and we'll call it In the Thick and we're gonna focus and center reporters and journalists and public thinkers and academics of color. Um, because we're kind of invisible from those talk shows. So, um, so anyway, back to my story of here at Brown. So I was a new correspondent, the first Latina correspondent at CNN. It was 1997. And I like finding stories that are kind of surprising, that others aren't telling. And so there was data, I haven't checked whether this is true now, but um, there was data that showed that African-American men had the fastest growing rate of suicide. And it turned out that there was a student, an African-American young man student here at Brown, um, who had attempted suicide. And he was very public about this, and we found him because he was doing engagement in 1997, talking about black men and suicide and mental health. So thank you, President Paxton, Paxton for talking about mental health. It's so, so central. And so we came here to do a story about him. That was my first time at Brown. It was 1997, and I, I did really fall in love with the campus. I, I was so beautiful. Um, but what really moved me was the fact that the university as such was so supportive and so public about their work around mental health and black men. And I just found that really fascinating. So there was a seed that was kind of um, planted inside for me, for Brown, for my love for Brown. But the truth is that what really made me fall in love with Brown was that the last words that my best friend ever said to me before she died one week later, I know it's sad, um, in 2015, was when she said that my daughter, Jurema, should definitely come to Brown. Um, Cecilia Weissman, may she rest in peace. She was a professor of journalism at Northwestern University. Um, my best friend from Barnard College, proud women's college graduate. Um, we were there, um, yes, hello. <laughs> Um, we met in 1979, we became the best of friends, and her daughter, Ana Rosa Marx Weissman, was um, a student here. While Cecilia was battling cancer, Ana Rosa was starting her, her college career right here at Brown. And, um, and Jurema um, was thinking of coming here. And I, I was not sure, I was afraid of, um, of her getting rejected, to be honest. So Jurema, by the way, her full name is Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa. You'll be tested on the way out. Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa. Repeat amongst yourselves. We're making it cool to have 16 names. So, so Jurema was looking at two colleges um, and Cecilia, on her last visit to chemotherapy, the last time I saw her, um, she said, you know, if you want your daughter to have an intellectually stimulating place like the Bohemian POC, politically charged arts and activist community filled with deep thinkers who are gonna become her best friends, but who are forever gonna be challenging her and 
and being partners with her in, her in her intellectual and spiritual journey, then yes, she's got to choose Brown over the competitive school. And those were the last words, those were the last words that Cecilia said to me. And she was so right. So, um, by the way, President Paxton, thank you to, to taking care of Ana Rosa. Whew, okay. <clears throat> Not gonna cry. Not yet. Not yet. Um, so, um, anyway, Ana Rosa will actually graduate this June, so I'm so proud of her. Um, yes. Anyway, so, um, I also came back to Brown because I was invited by, uh, a group of badass Latinx students, Latino and Latina students, um, who were activists here, and I was so proud to give a lecture to them. Um, and I love this place that has um, allowed myself to discover her own power. My daughter, I'm sorry, allowed my daughter to discover her own power and her voice. Um, it's true, President Paxton, I get lost all the time here. Thank God for that really weird blue bear. You know, because at least I get a sense of orienting because I'm always lost on this campus, but forever just falling in love with it even more. Um, but even though my daughter is going to be very upset, I don't care what you say, you too, you are a badass chingona, African, Dominicana, Taina, Mexican daughter of immigrants, New Yorker, and Harlem night. That is you. Um, she is getting her degree in modern culture and media. Um, and she is directing one of uh, the films for Brown Motion Pictures, so mic drop. Um, I'm very, very proud of her. Um, you know, but, so Brown is always gonna be challenging us intellectually. We understand that. I think that those of us parents who are in this room understand that when our kids come here, it is because it's gonna be an intellectual journey. Um, always pushing us to new heights. So, so just bear with me for a second. You might want to cover your ears. Um, bear, just bear with me. I'm being a little facetious, but um, so my daughter went to like the most incredible private uh, grammar school in New York City, Bank Street School, progressive education, and from there she got into one of the most extraordinary private high schools in New York City. Oh my God, Fieldston. Yeah. And then, you know, she, wait, wait, wait. and then she gets into one of the most difficult universities, colleges to get into, Brown. Oh my God. And then she gets into the most competitive team club in Brown, at Brown University. I know you're like, what is it? It's the physics club. It's the debate club. Chinese club. It's the pole dancing club. Yes, that's right. My daughter is a pole dancer. So all of that education was worth it for her to come here to the Ivy League and be on a pole dancing team. Thank you, President Paxton. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was worth every penny. <clears throat> She is my hero, though, my daughter, because um, I am not living through her. I am actually watching her blossom. And because, um, because she is blossoming in this way that as parents, we're always, you know, well, what are our kids going to do, right? So um, I've had to accept change. Yeah, when she told me she was on the pole dancing team, I was like, <clears throat> okay. It has forced me to accept my own fear of change. Because ultimately there is nothing to fear about change except our resistance to change, right? When Cecilia died, um, soon after a song sung by Mercedes Sosa was on the air, it was cambia, todo cambia, change, everything changes. And so that is what our life is full of. It is full of change and everything is going to change. And so part of our role as parents and as learners, right, is to be willing to accept the change. It's going to be hard. But there is some change, dear parents and students, that is really not acceptable for us to accept, that is just simply too painful 
So today, for example, I am not going to accept that a journalist, an American journalist with a green card, can be murdered in a foreign country and that we are all being gaslit and told that he was killed in a fight. By the way, rest in peace, Jamal Khashoggi. Can we take a moment of silence for him and for all the journalists in this country who are under threat? I did not think that that is what we would be talking about today. And yet, that is a reality for our country. So, yes, change. But also not just accepting what is not right. So, um, let me tell a, a quick little, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna tell a story really briefly that I usually tell. Um, I have been telling this story since I discovered this story um, about uh, 20 years ago. Um, so it was later in life when I found out what, what my arrival story was to this country. Um, so, and then when I finish the story, then I'm gonna tell you what this story now reveals to me and to all of us about this moment. So the story goes that my dad, may he rest in peace, was um, hired by the University of Chicago as a medical doctor dedicated to research in the inner ear. He ran their otolaryngology department of research. He was part of the large team of scientists that created the cochlear implant. Um, my dad was literally found by the University of Chicago and, and basically plucked and he became a citizen immediately and my family, my mom and the four kids, I was the youngest, came six months later. So we were flying from Mexico City to Dallas, Texas, changing planes in Dallas, Texas, and then getting on um, another plane to get to Chicago. And when we got to Dallas, Texas, that's where we were gonna do immigration. So my mom, um, pet, you know, small like me, five inches tall, with little petticoat heels and a, I'm sorry, kitten heels and a petticoat, with a petticoat. Um, and four kids under the age of seven, I was a toddler in her arms. And we get to the immigration agent, who is a very tall Texan dude. By the way, if any of you are from Texas, please forgive me, I'm about to imitate a Texan's accent. So, um, tall Texas immigration agent looks at my mom and says, well now ma'am, I see everything is in order here. I see that yourself and your four children, you do have your green cards in order. Thank you very much for that, ma'am. I see that this is all legal and correct. There's only one problem, ma'am. Uh, ma We're gonna have to keep the little one. She's gonna have to stay here. We're gonna have to put her into quarantine. She's got a little bit of a rash. And my mom told the story that something in her just came up from here that just like reached out to his arm, but not really. It was like her voice and her kitten heels on her tiptoes saying, sir, my name is Berta Hinojosa. And my husband is Dr. Raul Hinojosa. And he was invited to come here to the University of Chicago by the president of the University of Chicago. So you can get on the phone and you can call the president of the University of Chicago and ask him about Dr. Raul Hinojosa and his family because we are all coming into the United States of America. Myself and my four children, sir, do you understand, sir? And he said, yes, I do, ma'am, come on in. Come on in. I was in an airport where I normally am living when my mom called in the middle of the summer and my mom was in tears. ¿Qué pasa, mami? Mijita, they tried to do it to you. I'm like, what, mamita? What? Mijita, they tried to take you away from me just like they're taking away those kids right now at the border, they tried to do it to you. And that's what that voice was that I made fun of. She said, it was actually my panic. And so she said, now I'm in tears because I know those moms have nothing to do. They have no voice. So the story that I've been telling and making fun of and laughing about has actually become the story of this moment of this moment of revelation that it could have been me and that this is not new. So the good part about being a journalist is that I have no party. A pox on both their houses 
in terms of how they treat immigrants in this country, a pox on both their houses. The first time we had serious, the last time we had serious immigration reform was with a Repu Republican named Ronald Reagan. Complicated because of his relationship to Central America, which by the way, parents have not forgotten, but maybe that helps explain why there are Central American refugees trying to get to this country today. Oh, we forget about what happened 35 years ago. Okay. But you know, Bill Clinton signed into law the most restrictive immigration reform in 1996. George W. Bush ramped that up. Obama put those policies on steroids, and Trump has unleashed the ICE Gestapo. And I say that understanding that people are not being taken to death camps, but they are being taken to concentration camps, and we know that now because we have seen the pictures of where children are being held in tents with no windows, no schooling, they are being warehoused. And where in detention facilities, green card holders, green card holders, and I know there are many of you in this audience, that you can be held along with undocumented immigrants in conditions where you have no legally binding standards for how you are held. They do with us what they want. And you know why? Because we are just illegal. Let me share with you something that was not taught to me by the radical Latino, Latina studies professors at Barnard College. No, I learned this from Elie Wiesel, who could be no more different than me survivor of the Holocaust, and he was the one who said to me, never use the term illegal to refer to a human being. There is no such thing as an illegal human being. There is no such thing as an illegal immigrant. And you're saying, well, wait a second. I use that term all the time. It seems right. No. First of all, what Elie Wiesel said was the first thing they did, the Nazis, was that they declared the Jews to be an illegal people. It is the first step in dehumanizing. And the concept is incorrect. You can be an immigrant who crossed the border without papers. By the way, it's a misdemeanor. It has become criminalized now. But you are not an illegal immigrant. That would mean that any of you parents who have gotten a ticket in driving would forever now be an illegal driver. You're not. You understand? There is no logic there. And by the way, illegal is not a noun. So you can't say those illegals over there. So please, parents and students and professors, that is not a term we use to refer to human beings. In my newsroom, we also don't use the word minority, because I don't even know what that is. I never told you, Jurema, ever. I never said to you, because I, now I can say this. When I'm giving a speech, I, tell, I never say this to my kids, but she's right in front of me. I never said this to you. I never said, Mijita, you're a member of a minority group. Hamas. I'm not a minority. I don't think that way. And you know, another word that is not in my vocabulary is slave. They, were, they are people who were born and enslaved. They are not slaves. It's another way we dehumanize. These are people who became enslaved. And you know what? Family separation, I don't even know what that is. It's a sanitized way of saying, I don't know. Let me put out some terms for you. Government kidnapping of children? A foreign government holding children prisoners? Government abduction of innocent children? Human trafficking across state lines? It is not normal. And this dehumanization, queridos y queridas, has happened while we have been alive. We have all been a witness to this. And those of you who come from mixed status families, you are the heroes. Those of you who have undocumented family members, you are the heroes because you continue to dream when we are the center of what is being targeted now in the middle of the run-up to the midterms and we are the most hated people? We? My daughter? Because she speaks Spanish? Every single one of us right now has that privilege. We have that privilege. And so I ask you, as students, as parents, as professors, to own the privilege that we have in being right here. And don't ask what to do, what do I do? You know what to do. What I know is that I can't have you silent. Neither the students nor the professors, we can't have you silent. Not when it's the 50th anniversary of 1968, when students across the country were running the national narrative. So what are you doing? What are you doing? I am so thankful to have been given this opportunity to address you. 
I'm sure that you have many questions and the president is gonna come up and we're gonna be able to speak, but um, I just wanna say thank you to the Brown community for seeing me, um, for seeing I see you, and I say I am you. And specifically, thank you to the Brown community for seeing my daughter. Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, they have a, they have a screen over there where they type out the words Uy, that you're saying. I'm just wondering how that came out. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry for speaking so, so fast. No, no, no. Thank you. That was wonderful. So, so we have uh, two mics, one on each side. People can come up and ask questions. Uh, I do ask that questions are questions. That's it. Uh, and, and while people are thinking of what they might want to ta talk about, maybe I, maybe I can just start. And Please. it's an interesting day for me because I, I started this morning in this same spot uh, with Betsy West. I don't know, you, Betsy is a, a producer of documentaries, after a screening of RBG about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So it was a great opportunity to hear about a woman who really broke into a field where she wasn't welcome. You made some references in your talk about uh, being welcome or not being welcome as a journalist. Can you speak to that at all? I would say that um, overwhelmingly, I, I felt odd because um, we grew up consuming journalism and media as a Mexican immigrant family on the south side of Chicago, but I never saw myself reflected, so I never thought I could be a journalist. Um, but once my career guidance counselor forced me to apply to the internship to NPR, so go to them, they are very important people in lives, and she forced me to apply for the internship to NPR, and then I was like, okay. So I felt often like um, an oddball because I was the first Latina in all of these places, but that's where I understood that I had to silence that sense of the imposter syndrome, like I'm asking the students to do as well, and to understand that I had extraordinary power now. I had, um, I had privilege and that um, that privilege had to make me essentially eat my fear, a term I learned from my husband, hay que comerse el miedo, like literally eat your fear so that you can transform it into something else. So I felt odd, but I've not felt fearful as a journalist. Now, I, I don't let those thoughts get into my mind. I, I don't in terms of the fear. But, you know, um, I had a green card until 1988. It, that could have been me. Jamal Khashoggi could have been me. I could have just, you know, I have family members that still have green cards. So it, it that sense, it feels very scary right now. The normalization of just attacking journalists from one of the top newspapers of the country, the Washington Post. So if that can happen. So, so one more, uh, maybe a, another couple more questions. Uh, so you, you sort of work for your career. You work for NPR. You're at CBS, CNN. Well, I'm, I'm, I, yeah. I started at CBS. I'm on, actually, I'm a new contributor to CBS Sunday Morning. CBS Sunday Morning. That's yeah. right. That's right. But how was it going off and, and starting your own podcast? And Terrifying. How, uh, terrifying, right? Terrifying. So tell us about that, that decision. So one of the things I especially communicate, because, you know, I'm also, um, so I'm, I'm Mexican. That means I have 16 jobs. So I also am a professor. <laughs> Um, I'm a professor and a visiting uh, fellow, so I'm a professor at DePaul University um, in Chicago uh, for six months out of the year. I'm, not, I'm a fellow at Harvard at the Ken Kennedy School. Um, so one of the things, wait, what was the question? So, so the question of starting your own podcast, your own... Your own oh, right, so, okay, yeah. so one of the things that I tell my students is that, stop laughing, Pazia. So what I do is that I tell my students that they have to um, own their power, that they have to own their voices, and that most people are afraid. I tell them, I'm like, look, when I'm having a really challenging time, I'll think, hmm, who else is having a rough day in the media today? Hmm, Oprah. 
Why? Because Oprah borrowed $500 billion to start her channel. So she has to respond to $500 million that were invested. She has to respond to ROI. So she's having all kinds of issues around fear and still we plug forward. So what I'm trying to tell you is that this notion of doing scary things, um, we all have it. It has not stopped you. That's what I'm, especially to the students, it didn't stop you. So when you look at somebody who's doing something, you're like, wow, really? She just formed her own company? How did she do that? I mean, it's hard. It's scary. Um, I remember Jurema, my daughter, was the first person who I ever shared this with. Um, I said, I'm going to share this dream with you. I want to form my own company. And she was like, you do that, mom. <laughs> In that little voice. Um, so we're all fearful. We just cannot let that stop us. And again, for those of you who are on this campus and worry about being imposter, you know, having that imposter syndrome, you've got to take harness of that and quiet it. I do a lot of meditation as a result of trying to quiet that voice because I need you, again, not, fear, not fearful and powerful. How I remember when I was doing therapy many years ago and I was a new correspondent at NPR and I was scared. Um, my husband would joke, he, he said, you don't get PMS, you get PSS, pre-story syndrome, you know, and I'd just be like, I have to write a script, oh my God, this is so scary. And my therapist just said, let's just say, if you fall, what happens? And I was like, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll fall on the floor. And she's like, right, how much further can you go than the floor? And I was like, I don't know. And she said, and so what happens when you hit the ground and you're down? And I was like, I don't know, I'm going to get back up. She was like, exactly. So, um, so we have to eat that fear and, and understand that we here, this is what's hard, knowing that there are so many people who are facing so many challenges, and yet we here have extraordinary privilege if we are in this room. Um, and for those of you who don't have your parents and are in this room, um, you're here too. I, I see you. Thank you. So we have a question here. Yeah. Um, in the face of injustice or feeling righteous anger or feeling moved to be active, what advice would you give the students and families and professionals who are introverted? And by introverted, so they don't feel the fear, but being introverted, they don't feel the need to be out there. What, what advice could they do? Well, so I would say, that's a great question, by the way. Um, so there are different things that you can do. And again, I, 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 has, I hesitate to offer because I really feel like in this room, if people actually sat with that and were like, what could I do? So, um, I mean, there are so many places that need your help. Like, let's just take a small nonprofit in this community and you can just actually write them and say, hey, I can offer you this service. You may think, we may think, oh, it's nothing. It means nothing, but actually it means a lot. It's better to not walk into a nonprofit and say, hey, what can I do? But rather, I can do this, this, or this for you. Um, if you can write checks, that's so important in terms of nonprofits. And let them know why you're writing them. Um, you know, I'm raising money all the time. I run a nonprofit. And when people say, oh, I wish I could donate, but I don't feel like I have enough to donate, I'm like, if you donate $1 a month, that's a beautiful thing. So um, I think what we have to understand is that I actually, I often ask people to get outside of their comfort zone in this moment. I appreciate what you're saying, but I actually think that it's a time, it's okay for us to be out of our comfort zone and to be having conversations. Um, I do this all the time in an attempt to understand and also to humanize as much of my work as possible. Um, and I'm talking with a lot of people who um, look nothing like me. Sometimes just having those conversations one-on-one, -on -one and, and again, a lot of people are out of their comfort zones right now. So those are a couple of options. Thank you so much for your question, though. Thank you. And right over here, please. Uh, first, I want to thank you. That was an incredibly inspiring talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I don't work in the industry. It sounds like you've had an amazing career in journalism. Uh, but I worry about today's younger people who might want to follow in your footsteps, given the decline of the newspaper industry. You know. We'll, how could, if someone wants to make a difference the way you have in the journalism world, you know, what is the landscape today for young people starting out? First, you gotta be hungry. 
you have to have passion. You have got to, this is not for the faint of heart. So you have to have passion for doing this work. And um, we cannot give up. So I'm gonna throw some numbers out there. Don't quote me on this because they're rough. Um, but let's say like at the peak of the um, steel industry in our country, we had about 450,000 steel workers. And at the same time, like 35 years ago, we had about um, 400,000 journalists. We now have 125,000 steel workers and about 85,000 journalists. We have lost many journalists. So we cannot afford to lose more. And we need these young people, whether they are you know, taking internships at the Washington Post, at the New York Times, at Futuro Media, um, at smaller organizations, um, and, and training themselves so that they can either work their way up, um, you know, like the best Betsy Wests of the world, who you know, start in corporate media and then are doing their own production. We need them engaged, hungry, and learning um, the tenets of strong American journalism. Um, and, and so we need them now more than, more than ever. It's a strange thing, but the truth is, is that um, there has been a, a positive bump for our work because of these times. I hate to say it, but our audience is booming. And so we are growing. We're a small nonprofit media company with about 20 employees, and we're growing. Our audience doubled over the past five years. So there is work out there, but just don't have an illusion that it's going to be easy. And you've got to have the passion. And I didn't know when I was a student if I had the passion. I had to you know, kind of hone it. But we need you, desperately. Thank you. And I think we have time for maybe, yes, go ahead. I have a related question, which is how, how can journalists bring change when we're living in a society where everybody just listens to the voices that already agree with them? I mean, these are the, these are the huge questions, right? Um, I'll just give you an example of um, what recently happened to me, because I'm always, I'm always on the road. Um, so I was in Wichita, Kansas. Um, I had just given a speech the night before, and I was catching the earliest flight out because I hate hotels. <laughs> so I was um, in a shared cab at 4.45 in the morning from Wichita to the airport. And there were two white guys who were um, sitting, who, one who was driving and the other one sitting next to me. And uh, I was so sleepy, and I was like, I know, but this is a great time to have a conversation to all two guys. Okay, so then I just woke up and I said, hey guys, um, you know, first we talked about the weather, or whatever, and then I was like, um, hey, can I, uh, can I ask you guys a personal question? Surprisingly, they always say yes. <laughs> so I was like, hey, so who'd you vote for? And they were like, oh. And the guy in front said, oh man, well listen, the truth is I didn't vote for anyone. I just, I couldn't, you know, I didn't like any of them, so I didn't vote. I know I'm part of the problem, but I didn't do it. And guy sitting over here who was like 45 years old, married to a Colombian immigrant from um, Atlanta, Georgia, says, well, you asked, I, I voted for Trump. And I was like, okay, so let's talk about that. What, you know, he's like, you know, I can't stand the way he talks, but I believe in his policies. And then I was like, so you're like, so let's talk about what's happening in terms of, you know, the children and immigrants and this kind of, you know, the business of detaining and deporting. And, and then I just said, look, and he was like, well, you know, there are a lot of dangerous people who we need to stop. And I said, well, let, can I just cite a piece of data? I said, you know, whether it's a conservative think tank like the RAND Corporation or it's a progressive think tank like the Institute for Policy Studies, across the board, the data shows that immigrants are less likely to be criminals than American citizens. And he looked at me and he says, there you go. You're just like all those journalists. You're a liar, making stuff up. And it just stopped me in my tracks. Because I'm like, wait, what? Wait, what? H how do I have a conversation then? I was like, well, you know, and we didn't have time. You know, we were getting to the airport. But this is one of the core issues of our time, is how do we manage the fact that there are two different narratives going on. So whenever I'm not at home, um, I try to watch Fox News so that I can understand um, what is going on. Uh, my husband 
doesn't like to watch Fox News. So I don't want to do that in our time together, but I try to do that so I can understand another narrative. And I do the work of the conversations, of the difficult conversations and feeling a little uncomfortable. And I'm like, it's okay. Because part of what I say is um, I say, and by the way, I didn't know that this is a thing. We all witnessed it when two activists stood in an elevator with Senator Jeff Flake and were saying their experience, and then at one point they were saying, look at me. That's called, it's bird dogging. It's a political tactic that activists use to go and engage their um, elected officials, and they say, I'm gonna tell you my personal story, and if you look away, they're told to say, look at me when I'm speaking to you. Um, they were kind of yelling it to Senator Flake, but when I'm with somebody, I'll just say, look at me. I want you to see me. I am that Mexican immigrant I am that Mexican immigrant who you think is not going to be put into a detention facility that is me, that is my family. Look at me. And so the work that we have to do now is big, big stuff, huge ideas, getting back uh, uh, you know, the fourth estate so that we have some kind of way to operate. And at the same time, a lot of this work is at the most human level at the most human level. So I'm so thankful to be here and to be with all of my daughter's friends who I love and adore, all of them. Hi, Brian. Um, just, I love and adore them. And thank you for this amazing campus that I still get lost at and still, you know, and I'm, I'm in awe. Um, I don't walk around in the six inch heels on the campus because of it, you know. But I love this place and I, um, I'm so thankful that my daughter again has found her space here and that you have provided an extraordinary university for that to happen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.